Jim and Jack. Jim and Jack's on excellent the road. adventure. On the road. <laughs> um, Jim, why don't we start off? You recently gave a lecture at a business school um, comparing Renaissance entrepreneurship to today's entrepreneurship. Why don't we kick off with that before we get into the realms of AI and quantum? I'd love to. And it's been a wonderful couple of weeks in Europe. Uh, I was teaching at the Stanford and Florence Italy program. And the topic uh, was comparison of innovation and entrepreneurship in Renaissance Italy versus 21st century Silicon Valley. We're not going to have to get time to get into all the details, but absolutely loved it. Uh, spent wonderful time with students, faculty, uh, Italian leaders. Uh, and so for me, we are in an era now in Silicon Valley and technology where I think, one, academic centers are more important than ever in terms of the private companies that are being formed. Uh, so I try to visit at least once or twice a week via Zoom or in person many of the great universities of the UK, the United States, Europe. And what I'm finding is for this era of quantum, and all that quantum represents more than ever, and we've heard much of this earlier, we need phenomenal intellectual property, we need the best in world academic thinkers, and then a sense of urgency that has always been a hallmark of Silicon Valley, and as I said in Italy, absolutely not a hallmark of Italian bureaucracy. So number of changes that need to occur, but absolutely loved it and reflected on what Florence must have been like in 1500, where you had Leonardo and Michelangelo and Raphael and scientists, Galileo, all coming together in many ways to explore interdisciplinary entrepreneurship and making a profound difference in the world. No, it's wonderful. And quantum uh, has still not given us a time machine yet, but when it does, <laughs> we can all go back to Florence in Renaissance period and, and check that out as well. Uh, Jim, let's talk about a topic that's um, important for both of us, cybersecurity, and, and cyber particularly in the, in the quantum era. Um, you know, when we think about cyber, there's so many attacks happening across the board, traditional attacks, and there was uh, some panels already addressing on the traditional side. Uh, but when it comes now to the quantum era, um, store now, decrypt later, um, before I maybe go into some of the technical details, maybe put in context, Jim, for the audience, from an enterprise perspective, you've invested in a lot of enterprise companies. Um, what is it like for banks, for telcos, for pharma companies to think about this kind of issue? Well, we'll get into it, but this is the real deal, Jack Hittery, and I'm so proud to be a major investor in, in Sandbox. And it was a two and a half year journey in exploration. Uh, we spent some time on quantum at the World Economic Forum, the last one in, in fact, person. In fact, it was January 2000 when Correct. we were at DLD and then the ah. World Economic Forum. 2020. Yes. 2020. 2020. And uh, so not 2000, 2020. <laughs> not that long ago. 2020, just a few years ago. Uh, and you and I were talking about this. And Jim had heard a bit of whispers that we were developing something uh, in stealth mode inside Alphabet. And Jim's like, I know what you're up to, Jack. So <laughs> uh, it's time, I think, soon to spin it out, right? Absolutely. And so, uh, again, so proud. And again, what is so important, we've heard a lot of it uh, today. I have to confess, uh, I am an optimist, a glass half full individual. You almost have to be if you're an entrepreneur, uh, or in my case, a venture capitalist. And the opportunities around Web 3.0, around quantum, not just computing, we'll hear a lot more from Jack, but communication, sensing, the medical applications, uh, security for schools, for major academic institutions, obviously for governments. There are a series of applications, perhaps, that are more important than ever in a timely basis to start implementing around, simply because we know in the post-RSA world, uh, the attacks, the cyber threats will increase an order of magnitude or more. And so whether you're a large international corporation or telecom, retailer, hospital, a great university, it's more important than ever to be thinking about the security applications. And 
Jack's an expert. But again, I want to say also, DLD is very special to me. I've been coming for many years. Steffi, Yossi, the Berta team, uh, to me have, again, been at the forefront of where music, art, technology, publishing intersect. And it's at these intersections, if I advise students, entrepreneurs, uh, professors, uh, it's at the intersection where over the next decade, I believe the major opportunities will lie. In Web 2.0, you'd go very deep, whether it's Google or Meta or Apple, Microsoft, in a particular area. This next decade of investing in entrepreneurship is all about the intersection of, as we heard earlier, biology and computing, physics and computing, and that interdisciplinary set of skills, perhaps, for quantum is more important than yeah. ever before. No, and Jim, that's exactly what we're going to get into now. So let's kick off with the cyber side. Uh, I put up on the slide, store now, decrypt later. And this is something that some people may have heard of. Have people heard about this attack, SNDL, SNDL. So <laughs> new, to, new to many of the folks here. So SNDL is an attack that's going on right now as we're here in this auditorium at DLD. This attack is underway. This is an attack by sophisticated adversaries, state-sponsored adversaries, independent adversaries, who go into the servers of IP-rich companies, of governments. They exfiltrate encrypted information. This is very different, Jim, than what you and I are used to over the past 10 years of cyber. Typically, hackers are looking for data that was left in the open, as it were, in the wild, and they can go and grab that and sell it on the dark web or, or exploit it in different ways. In this case, the hackers are looking for encrypted information, knowing they can't read it now, but they'll store it now, and they'll decrypt it in a number of years. And that's particularly true for banks, for pharma companies, for governments, folks with a lot of IP, a lot of intellectual property. It could be, for example, trade secrets. Recently, there was a case uh, where someone got a 14-year sentence for trying to get the trade secrets of various chemical companies and Coca-Cola, a combination of those, to find the secret of how they made their cans in such a way that they would preserve the, uh, the contents it's very long. Uh, and that person just got a 14-year sentence this past, this past uh, week. Uh, so there's a lot of corporate espionage happening, and this now is one of the viral threats in terms of store now, decrypt later, of doing that. And so there's 20 billion devices. All of our phones in this room, the laptops, the servers, IoT devices that are out there that are vulnerable. And so here's the good news. We don't have to upgrade the actual hardware. We can keep the hardware, but we do need to upgrade the software. And the kind of cycles, Jim, that you and I know well that a bank has to go through to upgrade its entire <laughs> cyber infrastructure, this is not a trivial thing. So this is why it's important to start now uh, in terms of this area. And NIST, along with its counterparts here in Germany, in France, in the UK, uh, in many other countries around the world, about 50 countries all told, have been working on post-RSA protocols, protocols that we can all exchange information safely and securely, but without using RSA. RSA has served us well. It's been here since 1978, a 40-year run. I think, Jim, you would agree that's a pretty good run for an encryption standard. <laughs> but uh, right now, it's time to, to move on from that. So this area um, uh, of moving and migrating to a post-RSA is a subject of our recent Nature paper, Jim, which you and I can talk about a bit, in terms of laying out a roadmap. And folks may have received a copy of the, of the paper. If not, there's folks walking around who have copies if you want to get a copy. It just appeared in Nature, uh, the, the journal, this past week. And so I think it's a roadmap, Jim. But maybe talk a bit about, share with the audience, your experience for large enterprises. You know, what is this journey like to transition to a new kind of standard? It, it happens with extraordinary difficulty. Uh, we all know how bureaucratic governments can be, banks, large corporations, Fortune 10 types of corporations. And so what is different, the very best technologists in the world, whether they're at Oxford, Cambridge, uh, Stanford, Harvard, MIT, these are all professors, universities, where over the last two weeks I've had direct conversations. There isn't a question of if these security standards will become at risk. It's only a question of when. Is it 12 to 18 months? Is it 18 to 36 months? Most experts, and you're right in the midst of it, uh, most experts would agree it's within 36 months. 
And so that is very different from previous generational seismic potential changes like Y2K, where there was a big if. This time, the smartest people in the world that I talk to uh, would, say, would all agree it's only a question of when. And again, it's a question on quantum computing specifically. We have many of the best quantum computing entrepreneurs in the world here at DLD. It's only a question of when. Yeah. This is not a question of will this happen. There is major technology risk in each of these areas. And physicists at Stanford will disagree with the Nobel physicists at MIT, et cetera. But the technical approaches may vary. This, for investors, for entrepreneurs, for people in the world of medicine, and that's an area of great passion of mine, uh, will recognize that quantum imaging, quantum sensing, these are breakthroughs in the world of medicine as well. Yeah. So let's now move, uh, Jim, from the world of bits, the cyber world, where it's uh, bits that we have to protect, to the world of atoms. And in Silicon Valley, we've done a pretty good job with the world of bits. And I mean, Silicon Valley, I don't mean just the location. Yeah. I'm, I'm including all the startups here in Europe and across yeah. the world, Silicon Valley writ large. And we've done a pretty good job in the world of bits, but we've actually not done a very good job in the world of atoms. You look at the drug discovery process, a small molecule on average takes about 10, 15 years to get from molecule to medicine. A, a, the new battery chemistries. Battery chemistry does not improve with Moore's law, unfortunately. It's improving about four or 5% a year. Really not very impressive at all. So one question is, how can we use quantum to accelerate the world of atoms the way we've accelerated and learned how to accelerate the world of bits? And I put on the screen here, drug discovery and material science. Drug discovery, an obvious attack in terms of how we can move along that process. And what we found, Jim, as you know, is that we can now run these equations, these equations from Einstein and Schrodinger and Dirac, the equations that were developed right here in Europe, uh, and most of them right here in, in uh, Germany and a few in Switzerland. So uh, right, right today and where we're going next week, uh, these equations given to us 100 years ago are the ones we can now run on GPUs. And that's one of the breakthroughs we've had in terms of figuring out that NVIDIA and Google and AMD and all these companies that have made such powerful GPUs for initially gaming and then neural networks, we can now hijack those GPUs for the world of atoms. We can actually run these equations and predict whether this molecule will fit into that receptor for Alzheimer's. We're working on Alzheimer's right now as we speak. Parkinson's, oncology, heart disease. These are all critical diseases and unfortunately, uh, the world of medicine does not produce enough of the drugs fast enough to meet these. There's 7,000 underdrugged and undrugged diseases in the world today. So um, that's one area. And then, of course, material science with batteries, with battery chemistry, and other uh, items that are very important for the clean tech revolution. There was a panel earlier today on climate change, and obviously that's critical. So maybe, Jim, your thoughts on drug discovery, climate change, and the impact that's so important there. Yep. And we're out of time. Unfortunately, but to be continued <laughs> over minutes, drinks, yeah. uh, cocktails, dinner. My thesis is simply that for the last four years, the intersection of AI in particular and the life sciences has been one of the most fascinating, interesting areas to invest. A show of hands, how many of us have been touched by relatives or friends with cancer? It's close to 100%. Uh, my goal as an investor, of course, is to generate superb long-term returns. But through the 10 or so companies that I've spun out of Memorial Sloan Kettering and UCSF and elsewhere, I really would like to play a small role as an investor in eradicating certain cancers completely. And the very best scientists at Memorial Sloan Kettering and MD Anderson and Mass General believe that's possible with the aid of computation, both AI as well as quantum. And so if we can't get excited about that mission as investors, venture capitalists, uh, what can we get excited about? I could not be more passionate about that and bringing these teams together from these different disciplines and I'll find out in seven to 10 years whether I was right or not, but I've made 15 or so investments, as I've mentioned, many in stealth mode, 
many in and around what Sandbox's core technologies enable life science experts to further practice and develop these breakthrough solutions in the world of medicine. Well, Jim, this has been a great conversation. Thanks to Sheffi and Yossi at DLD for having us. Hubert. And Hubert. Hubert. Mr. Bird is, is here. Hi, Hubert. How are you? <clears throat>